This past week has been a time of tragedy and injustice in our nation. I want to take some time and speak about it tonight. I want to address it. Um, we had other plans for this evening, uh, but as the week unfolded, we really felt as a, as a staff that we needed to uh, address what's taking place and help us understand and, and process and, and know how we should respond and how we should react. Uh, this week we've seen heinous murders committed, racial tensions and issues were heightened. We saw a disrespect for officers that were encouraged. And basically a general unrest and fear has broken out in the country and we feel it. Does anybody feel it? We hear about it on the news, we hear about it on our, our Twitter, we hear about it on our Facebook, we hear about it at work from those we work with, from our family and friends, and we need to be able to come to the Bible and ask why and get an answer. We need to be able to come to the Bible and ask what are we supposed to do and get an answer. And so that's my goal tonight, is that we can do that. This past Thursday night, there was a lone gunman who ambushed and killed Five Dallas police officers. Many other officers were injured. I believe 11. Um, other incidents this week. People being shot. Instances and circumstances we don't know the details to. But these have caused a lot of questions in our heart. Um, even tonight. People telling me that they are afraid. There's fear in their heart. What, how, should, how should we go on our day-to-day life? And how should we respond to this? And as a church tonight, we just want to pause and reflect on this event that happened in Dallas. We will take time to pray for our country. Uh, We'll take time to pray for our leaders. We'll take time to pray for each other uh, in this time. Uh, I do want to say that our hearts and our prayers are with our country and are with the families that were affected by the evil that took place this week. And my goal for the next few minutes is simply to answer some important questions and give us all clear direction from God about how we should react to everything that's going on in our country. First question that we always ask in situations like this is why? Why does this happen? Why did this happen? Uh, we, We start to question everything that we know to be true. Sometimes we even question God and say, how did God allow this to happen? What is the reason this took place? How does evil like this exist? Um, I'm just going to bring out some basic things. and I want, We're going to be turning in the Bible tonight. But I want to remind you, when you ask the question why, I want to tell you that the reason why is not because God chose this to happen. The truth that I want you to see first is that God is the giver and the strongest advocate of life. Let me say that again. God is the giver and the strongest advocate of life. Uh, I don't believe for a second that God would say, I, this is what I want to happen. This is, uh, I, I do understand the sovereignty of God and the idea that He allows some things to happen. But the Bible is very clear that it is God that gives life, and He wants life to continue in all, in all circumstances. In Genesis 2.7, The Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Every person involved in this incident this week, police officer, person that uh, shot police officers, civilians, us, as we're bystanders and watching these things take place, we are all... Uh, designed to have life by God. He chose us to have life. He created man. He breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. In Genesis 131, we see his opinion on this life that he created. He says, uh, the Bible says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. All of the animals that God made and all of the planets that God made and everything in the water that God made, he, he always said it was good. But when it came to human life, God said it was very good. He values human life. He's the giver and the advocate of life. God is the creator. It was his great idea. 
in the scriptures, Jesus, he's even called the life. It's, it's Jesus' defining quality, this life. In John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's something. When you're defining characteristic, the, the title that you're given, the who you are is life. Jesus is life, and Jesus is God. And so we know that God advocates, and he, he, because he is life, he hates this death. Um, Jesus, he in the scriptures, is known as the good shepherd. Uh, in John 10, verses 10 and 11, the Bible says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Jesus values our lives and the lives of every person, no matter their nationality, no matter their sin, no matter anything about them, the fact that they are a human being, Jesus values them to the point where he would lay down his life for theirs. God is the giver and the strongest advocate of life. So why do things like this happen? Uh, Why do, how can someone be evil to kill someone that is meant to protect them? How can, how can people hate others in, in the way of uh, a white person hating a black person? Uh, uh, somebody uh, across the country, across the waters, hating us, uh, coming to our country to hate us. We have all these issues going around where people hate, where this wickedness happens. But why? Why do they happen? And here's the point. It's because the sin of man and evil in this world it brings death to our lives. The sin of man and the evil of this world is what brings death to our lives. Again, in John chapter 10, it's very clear the contrast between Jesus and this thief that we know as the devil, the the evil one in the world. In John 10, 10, again, the Bible said, the thief comes not, but the, the only reason he's here is for to steal, to kill, and to destroy Jesus is the opposite. He's come that we might have life. The evil one, Satan, from the very beginning of people and the existence on the earth, has sought to steal, kill, and destroy life. In the Garden of Eden, we read the story of Satan using temptation to cause men to sin. Uh, we, we know the story that, that Satan as a serpent came in and he caused and he, he tempted uh, with this fruit that looked good and, and the, the questioning of God and, and what he valued. And, and Satan tempted Eve and Eve ate of this fruit and she sinned. And, and, and God said that in the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. This is when death came into the world. And we know it in Romans 5 verse number 12. Because the Bible says, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. That one man is Adam. He, he got to stand in our place as our representative. He, he sinned along with Eve. And Adam, he died spiritually. And he brought this sin nature into the world so that every man thereafter, every man, woman, boy, or girl is born with a natural bent towards sin. That means naturally, without any outside uh, circumstances, any outside pressures, you have a natural tendency to do things that are evil and wicked before God. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, death and destruction and the hatred and the violence is an extension and comes from the root of sin, okay? And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. See, sin is natural to all men. Sin is so terrible and it's so strong. It goes deep into your heart. It stems deep from your heart and it knows no limits. Sometimes sin to us uh, is a little more tolerable when someone lies to you or when somebody uh, takes the $2 sitting uh, on the counter that you were going to have or whatever. This is sin. This is stealing and lying. But sometimes sin shows up and it's something so heinous because it's out of the ordinary. And this is what we saw this week. Uh, This week in our world, 
sin of all different kinds was highlighted. It was thrown up in our faces to, to, to face and to question as to why. But the reason why is because sin is deep in the heart of men. In Jeremiah 17, 9, the Bible says, The heart is deceitful above all things. There is nothing more deceitful than the heart of a man or the heart of a woman. It says the heart, your heart, the inside parts of you, your, your mind, your will and emotions is desperately wicked. Why is it that people lie? Why is it that people steal? Why is it that people hate people? Why is it that people murder? It is because they have a wickedness down in their heart called sin. The Bible says who can know it? We cannot know the the result of sin. We cannot know the limit of sin. The Bible says it questions. Who can know it? We cannot know it. Sin always goes further. And when we think it went far, we, it always goes further. Sin is wicked. Our hearts are wicked. See, the sin nature that passed down from Adam is inside of men. And, and it's because of this sin nature that men are cursed and, men are, and, and then without God are capable of despicable crime. I want you to see the Bible gives us a really nice list of who we are naturally, what we can do naturally without God. It's in Galatians chapter 5. You can turn there. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, uh, we, we see in Galatians 5 this, this parallel, this kind of compare and contrast. It talks about somebody with that's a Christian that has the Holy Spirit living inside them, and then the behaviors and actions that they'll do, they call, call it the fruit of the Spirit. But there's these behaviors in here called the works of the flesh. That's who you are naturally. That's what comes out of you outside of God. Listen to this list. Tell me if you've seen it play out in your life and in, on the news and in our country. The Bible says, now the works of the flesh are manifest. That means they're shown, they're clearly displayed, which are these. Adultery. For someone to violate a marriage vow, for someone to cheat on their spouse, for someone to have sex before marriage. Next one here, fornication. This, this idea in our country, it used to be a heinous sin that we thought when, when people would live together uh, before they were married. Now it's become normal. Do you see how, how sin just keeps going further and further? But these are natural things that come out of our flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, things that are just dirty, things that are uh, sexual, things that are against God, lasciviousness, idolatry. We've got sin like witchcraft. We've got the sin of hatred. Uh, Some of you don't deal with hatred. You may deal with part of hatred, anger. Uh, But hatred, this idea that I completely despise somebody to the to the extent that I would wish them to die that I despise somebody to the extent that I would wish their life be taken away that they don't deserve life but I do this is hatred Uh, I hate somebody based upon a quality that they have in their life based upon a belief that they have in their life based upon the color of their skin or where they're from or the neighborhood they live in this is hatred hatred stems from our flesh it's who we are naturally just for some people, they let that hatred come out. They give into the hatred. Variance, emulations, uh, these are all things like fighting and arguing. Wrath, strife, you know, these are uh, strong anger, uh, arguing in a, in a relationship, this strife. And you can go on and on. Seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, or, or partying, and the such like of I tell Uh, Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. See, it's because people that do these things, they're without Christ, right? When we have Christ in our life, now we have the Holy Spirit that we can submit to, to be able to do the fruit of the Spirit. But naturally, naturally, the sin of man and the evil of this world is what is causing these things in our life. It's the works of the flesh Our natural wickedness from the inside comes out in this list of things in Galatians chapter 5. I want to point out not only that God is the giver and the strongest advocate of life. Not only is the sin of man and the evil in this world the, the root cause of the death and destruction we see in our lives. 
But thirdly, we are not fighting a physical battle. We are fighting a spiritual battle. If you turn in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, we have to realize that this stuff we're facing, whatever you think we're facing, some of you think we're facing uh, police officers that are out of control. Some of you think we're facing racial tensions, black versus white, Muslim, uh, we're thinking uh, religious tensions. Some of you think those are the problems. Some of you think the problem is uh, the politicians that are crooked and corrupt. Some of you think all these things you see on the news are the problem. But I, I want to tell you those are not the problem. Uh, It's not a physical thing. It's not something you see with your eyes. It is a spiritual issue that is the problem. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the Bible says, For though we walk in the flesh, though we live here and we see these things happening, uh, person to person, body to body, things we can see, we do not war or battle after the flesh. See, it's not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Physical battles are fought with physical weapons. Spiritual battles are fought with spiritual weapons weapons. You see, the issue that we face that shows up, see the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, these issues we see on the news, the race issue, the fighting that we see, uh, all, all politicized, the, uh, the, the murders, uh, depending it's a police getting killed or a police killing, uh, whatever it is, these issues These are the physical things that we see, but we do not fight these things in a physical way. We fight them with spiritual weapons. See, the issue is not a race issue. I I, want to make very clear when it comes to racism in the church, God is very clear how he created people. In Genesis 1, 26 through 27, here's what he said. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. The only distinguishing characteristic God showed to uh, divide this human race was male and female, okay? Uh, this This is what he makes clear to us, that how should we divide ourselves? We divide ourselves male and female, okay? And this is really, this is something that's under attack as well in our country. God created the male and female, but I want you to show you that God created every person. He created man in his own image, He created them to be like him. There's a value that comes with that. In Psalm 33, verses 13 through 15, the Lord looks from heaven. Psalm 33, verse 13. The Lord looketh from heaven. He beholds all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. It's neat. He's he's looking down. He's seeing everybody in the world. All the inhabitants of the earth. All the inhabitants in your neighborhood all the inhabitants in the neighborhood you wouldn't move into, all the inhabitants in Dallas, all the inhabitants of the world, everywhere they're at, in the Middle East. He's looking down, and this is what he says. The Bible says, He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. The Bible is very clear that though we may look different, though we may have different interests, those things ought not to divide us. We have common hearts. Uh, our, our hearts are all deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We have, a, we have a heart that is in great need of Jesus. And Jesus loves all of those people that he looks down upon. In Acts 17, 26, the Bible makes it very clear. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Though there are dividing lines because we have different countries and we, we live in different states or we live in different neighborhoods, it, 
God makes it very clear that racism is not the issue because we are all one blood. Do you understand? This is the view of Scripture. If, if you have comments in your household that, that downgrade somebody that's a different color than you, or, or you, you feed into something that's going on so that you are pitting one color against the other, you are not handling the situation in a biblical way. God would have you to take a situation like this and ask, how would God want me to react? Because if we're bought with a price, we don't get the choice as people that are owned by Jesus to choose how we react. We need to ask how God would have us react, and it would have us, he would have us react in a way that lines up with the Bible. And the Bible is very clear. Every man is made in the image of God. Every man is of one blood. God fashions all of our hearts alike. And so if God doesn't see those colors, then we do not see those colors either. Does that make sense? Race is not the issue. It's not an issue of the local police. This is something that's been brought to light is that uh, there's, this, there's this thing that, well, if, if we don't like police officers, then we resist police officers and, and we defy them or we question them or we get to do what we want because we don't like. God is very clear when it comes to government and the authorities that are set up over us. In Romans chapter 13, you can turn there. Romans 13, verse number one, listen to this. Let every soul... Can you raise your hand, please? That's you in here. Every soul. Every soul is you, okay? Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. That word subject is the idea of to place yourself under the authority of. Uh, Let every soul place themselves under the authority of the higher powers. That means you listen to them. That means you honor them. You obey them. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Isn't that interesting? Police officers are there because God has called them to be there. Did you know that? Government officials are there because God has called them to be there. And the Bible is very clear that we are to place ourselves under their authority. Because God gave them their power. There's no power. They don't get their power on their own. God gave it to them. Verse 2, whosoever therefore resisteth the power. If you question the authority that God's placed in your life. Now I'm not saying question like you can't ask a question. I'm saying, this is saying resist. You defy. You take, you see authority and you say, I'm going to defy the authority. I don't care what the authority is. I'm disregarding that. The Bible says, if you resist the power, you resist the ordinance of God. You're resisting what God set up. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now, to be honest with you, I haven't taken time to figure that one out, what that means, but that sounds like strong language to me. For rulers, those that are in authority over you, the police, the sheriff department, they're not a terror to good works, but to the evil. See, God doesn't set up government and allow government to have power over us so that they can hurt those that are doing good. The idea is that they will be a terror to those that are doing evil. It says, uh, Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Uh, do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he, that is the officer, that is this ruler, this is the higher power, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. You say, minister of God, that sounds like a pastor. No, no, no. This is speaking of someone that's in authority, like a police officer. We think of Pastor Tony, as ordained of God. Uh, we think of Pastor says, you know, this is, this is the minister of God, but police officers are the ministers of God, right here, to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. It's, this is very serious. If you do that which is evil, be afraid. For he that beareth, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. You see, the intention of these authorities in our lives are to, uh, to make sure that justice is served, to make sure that right is done. Now, I do not want to make any excuses for anybody that doesn't fulfill the role that they have as a higher power. But just because you hear or you see someone else react and disregard authority doesn't mean that you should. We follow the Bible. 
The Bible says, wherefore, verse 5, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience's sake. For this, for, for this cause, pay ye tribute also. Ah, pay taxes. For they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom is fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. If you ever see anything that downgrades the role of the police, that downgrades the, the role of law enforcement, as Christians, we must be behind the law enforcement. They are ministers of God for our good. So it's not an issue about local police this week. See, the issue is a spiritual issue. It's just, it just coming out in different ways. The issue is men's hearts are wicked. The issue is that people are naturally sinners. The issue that, is that sin in somebody's heart is coming out. So what's the problem? Well, I mean, how do we fix it? What do we do? See, it's a spiritual issue that can only be corrected by Jesus Christ when he makes an evil man new on the inside. It's a spiritual issue that can only be corrected by Jesus Christ when he makes an evil man new on the inside. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us this, if, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We go into this battle, when we, when we face these things this week, when we face what's going on and we have to deal with it, we don't deal with it in a worldly way. We deal with it in a spiritual way. We need Jesus to deal with it. See, the Bible says our weapons, they're not carnal weapons, they're not fleshly weapons, they're not physical weapons, but they're mighty weapons through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We've got to realize tonight, and my whole point of this is just to give you that clear answer. The answer is not to keep complaining. The answer is, n- listen, um, I'm just going to be honest. There, there is too much talking and not enough praying. Way too much Facebook posts and reshares, and I can't believe this. There is nothing, nothing that can ever, there's, there's scripture passages in detail that tell you that nothing can ever be done through worrying about something. You know, how can a man add one cubit to his stature if he worries about it? How can a man do anything, uh, you know, if you're complaining? Complaining never accomplishes anything, but prayer does. The Bible says that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The Bible says that these people, if, if they know about Jesus and Jesus gets in their life and Jesus comes in, he'll clean out all the wickedness that's coming out in hatred, that's coming out in racism, that's coming out in all of these sins we see. He'll clean that out and he'll make them a new person. So the answer is prayer, but the answer is to stop being disengaged as a Christian and get involved in the mission of what we're supposed to be doing as a church. The mission is to go and share the gospel. With you say, ah, Uh, What do I do? What do I do? We share the gospel. We let Jesus solve the problem. That is the answer. The answer for our violent communities is for churches to go into those communities and preach the gospel and to see people saved and to see people change the way they lead their kids, to change the way they raise their kids, to change from the inside out. It is a spiritual battle. It has to be fought a spiritual way. 